Looking on the highways, streets and on the byways, men and women lonely without a reason to live. Searching for the right way, waiting for a bright day, I got just one thing to say. Call Jesus today, this cannot be. If the church would obey the call of the Savior and show them the way, this cannot be. Just try and you'll see the hand of Jesus is reaching for them Looking in the world now Guns and bombs are raining We just don't know how The future's gonna be Refugees are starving Men and women dying And so on I can go on and on it's about care and concern for the people. Now, somebody mentioned Eldoret. This is how it goes. If he walked on your dark streets tonight, what would he see? If he came for lunch at your house, what would you serve him? If he came like a street boy to you, would you have room for him? And if he came like a stranger in rags, what would you do? Eldoret, land of the happy and free. of fame What if Jesus would visit today Eldoret Would you be ready for him Have you heard that one? You like it? Okay all right there's just one more there are tons of them but let me do one last one because it's almost christmas she was brought to the city at the age of nine to work as a house girl for marie her little hands Worked hard till late at night To earn 600 shillings every month For two years now she's pleaded with Marie Please pay me so I could go home for Christmas But Marie would scream and shout Right into the neighborhood so one more time the little girl chose to try She said, please let me go home for Christmas I've never spent one Christmas far from home And I do miss Papa and Mama is unwell And I long to see and play with my sister He took a neighbor to see her on her way Child abuse with nothing in return With worn out clothes and shoes she took the bus It was hard to tell what kind of tears she cried Could it be the joy of going home at 
last Or could it be the memory of her time in hell But when she came back home And they told her mama is gone You had more questions than answers deep inside And I've been looking at the music of uh, a British Anglican priest called Garth Hewitt. I've gone back to growing up on the music of Silver Wind, singing about the suffering behind the Iron Curtain. I've been looking even at the music of Miriam Makeba and how she sang about injustice in South Africa. I've even looked at the music of Bob Malay and why he was singing the kind of songs he's been singing. My dissertation is actually on music and social justice. But I don't want you to know about my dissertation. And I don't want you to know about my music. I want you to know about the heart of God concerning social justice. That is why I have titled my sermon From Ashes to Beauty, a call for social justice. As Christians, we have two kinds of relationships. There is a vertical one that reaches out to God upwards. And there is a horizontal one that reaches across to the people around us. We are related, we are connected to family, to people that we work with. We are connected to the community around us. And God expects us as Christians to respond in those two ways. There is a transcendent, but there is also a horizontal axis that reaches out all around us. And if you go back to the Ten Commandments, they are really about those two axes. They are commandments that help you to love God. And they are commandments that help you to relate to your neighbor. That's why it would be wrong to steal, to kill, and to bear false witness. Because you hurt your neighbor when you do that. And Jesus says, the commandments are only two, really. One, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the next is just as important, love your neighbor as yourself. That is the answer Jesus gives. And today, if you ask me, the tendency has been for the Christian to put a wedge between loving God and loving neighbor. In fact, if you were to summarize uh, the constitution of Kenya, or that of the US or Europe or South Africa, you'd find that all constitutions point to only two things, one more than the other because they don't take the transcendent that, more, that importantly. That is, there is a higher power, we are responsible, we are answerable to our creator, but secondly, we are answerable to one another. And you cannot dump social justice as a Christian. No, you can't. And brothers and sisters, we are surrounded by people in ashes all over the place. In this congregation, there are people who came into this house in ashes, in pain, and I pray that we'll have some time to pray for one another because the ashes are everywhere. In fact, there are people here that came and the economy has so beaten them that given a chance, they would take a rope and hang themselves because they hear if you hang yourself, you can die. There are policemen in our country that are killing themselves. They have the power to protect uh, but they kill themselves because they, they can't take life anymore. You have people who've been working, they're sacked, and they take their children's lives and then take their own lives because it's too painful to continue living. Do you know 
that as I speak to you, there are people in this town of Eldoret that are doing everything to leave the country because Kenya has become unbearable. I know people who are working for me and I couldn't sustain them anymore, but they left the country. There are people saying, hata hapa, hata nikipata kazi, I'm not going to be able to take care of my family. So they go to the Middle East or somewhere to look for a job. They become migrant workers. And out there, some of them come back in a coffin. The world is full of ashes. There are people leaving Africa and drowning in the Mediterranean because they want better. Life has become unbearable. I was looking at the uh, poverty index. And I looked at uh, um, a Concern Worldwide. It's a group that uh, looks at uh, uh, issues of hunger and poverty and so on. And they delineated 10 most hungry countries in the world. At number 10 was Sierra Leone, the global hunger index of 35.3%. At number nine was Liberia, 32.2. At number eight was Guinea-Bissau. GHI index, 33.0. Number seven, Chad, 34.6. Number six, Niger or Niger, 35.1. Number five, Lesotho, 35.5. At number four was sadly DRC, 35.7. With all the gold, hungry. Number three was Yemen. You know the war that is going on there and so on. Country broken, 39.9. At number two was Madagascar, 41.0. At number one, almost emerging out of this, is Central African Republic with 42.3. Did you note that the most hungry countries, according to this index, the majority of them are from Africa. And yet Africa has a lot of food, a lot of rain, a lot of productivity, a lot of agriculturalists. Africa has so much resource, yet we harbor the hungriest nations according to Concern Worldwide. Is it any wonder that Michael Jackson in 1984 put some musicians together and they sang, we are the world, we are the, you know, we've got to make a difference. He sang that. Heal the world. Make it a better place. These are secular musicians raising the concern for people. Where are the Christian musicians? Isn't social action treated as secular? It is. We have HIV, AIDS, we have all these problems. We have hunger, we have an economic crisis. Today, if you wrote a song about the need for equitable distribution, you'd be called a secular artist. The world is living in ashes, and who is supposed to bring the answer? You and I. I was also looking at uh, the, world popu uh, the, the population review. And I was looking at the countries that have people dying a lot. And the 10 countries where people are dying so much, at number, uh, I mean, the first one uh, is Bulgaria, 15.4. Number two, Ukraine, 15.2. Number three is Latvia, 34.6. At number four is Lesotho again, 14.3. At number five, Lithuania, 13.6. Six, Serbia, 13.2. At number seven, Croatia, 13.1. Number eight, Romania, 13.0. Number nine, Georgia, the Eastern Europe, Georgia, 12.8. Number 10, Russia, this great superpower, 12.7. People are dying everywhere. 
there is a crisis. And you would think maybe this is a modern phenomenon. No, it is not. By the way, during the days of Jesus, and uh, Jerusalem at that point had maybe a population of 30,000 to 50,000 people or so. Galilee had about 200 villages. Uh, population general, Akina Josephus, Josephus estimate maybe two, 200,000 overall in that region. And so those were a lot of people for that time. In case you think there are more problems now, uh, Israel was actually colonized by Rome. And Rome imposed a lot of taxes on Israel. In fact, people like Zacchaeus were hated because of collecting taxes for the Romans. Mamboya tax Hayak Wanza 2022. Otherwise, would not be, you know, reading about uh, Zacchaeus and Matthew, the tax collector, and so on. And there were landlords that charged, you know, uh, rent. There were people in Jesus' day that could not afford life. Now, I was uh, looking at uh, uh, a citation of s someone that uh, wrote about this situation um, from the University of Pretoria. Uh, and uh, he wrote this. He says, in the ancient world, Poverty was a visible and common phenomenon. According to estimations, nine out of ten persons lived close to the subsistence level or below it. There was no middle class at that time. The state did not show much concern for the poor. And you can see Jesus born in that kind of situation and reaching out. Jesus reached out to the destitutes. He reached out to those who are disgruntled. He reached out and helped, you know, women that were facing dejection. Do you know the average Jewish man would wake up in the morning and thank God for two things in prayer? Number one, that he was not a Gentile. And number two, that he was not a woman. Someone thanking God for that. Thank you, Lord. You did not create me a Gentile. Thank you, Lord. You did not create me a woman. Gender-based segregation and even violence is not new. Now we sit here today asking the question, what do we do? The Bible has actually addressed this. And I would like you to turn with me now to the book of Isaiah for just a moment. This passage in Isaiah, and we're going to Isaiah 61, marks what I would call the classic call to social action by the church. So classic is it that Jesus, when he went to the synagogue at one point, he was given a chance to read from the scriptures. They used to read from the law and the prophets, and then they would uh, um, read from the wisdom and so on. When he was asked to read a passage, and this is recorded for us in Luke chapter 4 from verse 14, Jesus picks a passage in Isaiah, and he picks Isaiah 61. So this is where Jesus read from. From verse 1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Luke 4, Jesus stops there. But Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, I would argue theologically that Jesus suspended the reading of that vengeance because it is yet to come. But the season of grace is here. 
The time and the favor of God is right with us. The judgment is yet to come. And what a privilege that before the judgment we can bring the good news to the people. And he goes on to say to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Wow. They will be called oaks of righteousness a planting of the lord for the display of his splendor you want to see how god displays his splendor it is by turning people from being crushed under ashes and putting beauty on them that is the work of God. That is what pleases God's heart. And notice that this is the work of the Spirit. Messiah means the anointed one. And Jesus is anointed of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God anoints you, comes upon you, he does not only produce fruit... And that is what the world is looking for. But he's a counselor, a comforter. He is there bringing truth. When I look at the work of the Spirit, I smile. It is admirable. And indeed, as followers of Jesus, full of the Spirit, we should be producing not just fruit, but when the Spirit of God is upon us, we become sent to our communities, to our families, to our nations to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness. Too much darkness in Eldoret, too much darkness in our country, too much darkness in Africa. We become the light of the world, the solution to the problems of the world. We become social care givers to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The gospel is not bad news. The gospel is good news. And yet so many of us are excited to tell people how they are going to hell. Hell was actually made for the devil and his angels. The good news is about making it to heaven. It's about sins being forgiven. It's about freedom from drug addiction, freedom from prostitution, freedom from bad thoughts, freedom from suicide, freedom from sorrow, freedom from depression. That is the gospel. And this afternoon, I wish we would have more Christians preaching the good news. The first thing you tell people around you is not how ugly they are, how f they are failures. It's not how, you know, just give up. You know, no, 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 no. Kenya inaenda kuangamia. No, no. Be bearers of good news. Good tidings. To bestow on them a crown of beauty. Move people from ashes. You know in those days, if you are mourning, you poured ashes on yourself. God is saying, I'm replacing those ashes. Ninabadilisha. It's no longer ashes. You're not going to sit there despairing, depressed, defeated, and so on. Like I said, in this congregation, a lot of people with secret pain. Hidden pain. Some people are here. They lost jobs. It's a fact. But you don't have to give up. I mean, the God who gave you a job will yet give you another one. He's able to. Haukuanayo akakupa. So he's able. You know, don't sit there thinking, I lost my child. I lost my husband. I lost my wife. I lost my sister. I lost the one who used to pay my fees. Therefore, my world has come to an end. Your world has not come to an end. God is not through with you. There are people here, they're going through stuff they can never tell you. At Okiwambia, let's share. They will never tell you because some things are too deep. 
And even if they told you, what is it you can do? What do you do? How do you even feel the pain of a lady that just went through a miscarriage? Even as another lady, can you really bring comfort to them? As a man, you are the most disqualified to even talk to them about it. And so, how about the God who gives life? How about the one who puts you together? How about the one who knows what you go through alone when you are sharing your tears with your pillow? That is the God that is saying... You are not done yet. Hi, Jaisha. You can start again. It's possible. And that care is not just a sit thing. That care spread right through the early church. I told the first, in the, the first service, if you want to know how the world runs or how the world should run, you go to the foundations in Genesis. If you really want to know how the church should run, you go... I was telling my friends, you people are blessed to have your Bible in one. Mimi itaja boot ndio ikuje yote. So thank God, thank God for your, thank you. And thank you. Um, so if you want to know how the church runs, you go to the early church. So turn with me to the book that talks about the early church, the, the book of Acts. And turn with me to Acts chapter 4. There are some strange things in Acts 4 on social action. You know, in chapter 2, the church is growing. You know, in a day, 5,000 people being added because of one little detail. That people were not just saying, get saved in Uamkono. But they would eat with one another. They would pray with one another. They would fellowship with one another. They would be there. Now, in chapter 4, from verse 32, it says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Now, verse 34 is a strange verse. It says there were no needy people there are no needy persons among them. Did you hear that one? For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. I need to qualify that this has been abused in our day. But I must say this, Augustine put it very well, never judge a philosophy by its abuse. Just because it has been abused doesn't mean it is not to be done or it's not the right thing. So, you know, if Christianity has been abused, people have been hypocritical. If, if you can tell that they are hypocrites, it means you know the right thing also. So here we are. There are no needy people among the why? Because people from time to time, it doesn't say every time. From time to time, they would sell stuff. Now, it doesn't give us all the details, but you can tell that those who would sell property had quite a bit of property. It's not saying that they sold everything. If you sell everything, you, where do you, does your family stay? So if you had three houses or, and so on, and I showed you the uh, socioeconomic situation at the time under the Roman rule, so you could sell and give money for the disciples or the apostles to distribute to those who had need. What a beautiful thing. Now, back in 1987, 88, um, I wrote a book, a small book. Uh, that was during Moy's era. So uh, he had spies in the university and so on. So we had to be careful. All my magazines and so on, I used to hide in between clothes so that I wish I could tell you where we've come from. 
So I wrote a book called Communism and the Christian Faith, trying to show that actually what the socialists and the communists are trying to do is smuggling through the back door what the early church was trying to do. It's not about uh, giving up everything or being lazy or, uh, you know, it's, it's not the socialism that implies careless distribution of resources. Um, and I was trying to show that the only way we can actually defeat negative capitalism and negative socialism is by going back to the early church. Now, look at chapter 6 for just a bit so that you know where I'm coming from. In chapter 6 of Acts, there is a problem. And the problem is there is a bit of racial uh, segregation. There is a bit of uh, concentration. Some communities are getting resources, others are not. The kind of thing that goes on in Kenya. From verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit. Did you hear that one? And wisdom, two things full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. That for me is one of the motivations behind value-based leadership. That you have people who are full of the spirit and who are full of wisdom, that they can dispense social action equally without having to be pushed. Because when the spirit of God is in you, you act fairly. And that pleases the heart of God. It so pleases the heart of God that failure to do justly, in fact, attracts the wrath of God. It attracts the wrath of God. And I can tell you for sure that as a Christian, if there was one thing that would mark who a true Christian is, it would be one detail that Jesus gives us in John chapter 13 and verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give you, a new commandment I leave with you, love one another. And he adds on and says, men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And G.K. Chesterton put it so well, he said, it's not that the world has, uh, you know, had so much Christianity and gotten tired of it. He says that it has not had enough Christianity to be tired of. You know, a lot of the things that we are fixing as a country are a res as a result of neglect of social ministry by the church. I'm writing a tiny book, and I hope, you know, there are books you write and you only publish when you die. Because if you released the book when you were alive, it would have repercussions. So you release it, you, you, you write a will and say, publish this book after I'm dead. And some of the things, I don't know, maybe with the Lord's help I can temper and release it before I die. But some of the questions I'm asking include the question of how is it possible for a church to bank two or three billion shillings 
from the offerings and tithes of people who walk back home. Uh oh. I'm asking, why is it as a church we still talk about the poor among us? How can people in Eldoret go hungry, yet Eldoret is a breadbasket? Is that rocket science? No. How is it that we take it so casually when pastor uh, the, and the leadership here say we want to put up a bread basket? We want you to contribute maize or beans and bring. So why is it it is so heavy on us and yet that is the one thing that is going to make a difference among us in terms of taking care of the needs of others? In India, I'm told there is a church where the, the pastor said, every Sunday when we gather, just bring one kilo of rice. One kilo. And they bring, and you know, they feed the, the hungry in such a way that they are no hungry in that city. Is it doable? It is doable. It is possible. We are not asking you to give a sack. We are just saying, as, the, as God blesses you, bring something. Pastor, mimi naomba mwanzishe hiyo kitu. Na badala ya kuniita niimbe muniite nipeleke chakula marsabit. I would be so delighted to be part of solving small problems. These are not big problems. And right now, I know the economy is bad. Yes, and the problem is we are leaving it to President Ruto and Gashagwa and the rest to solve. Those people with macro-oriented macro solutions to the country, watakuja langa sangapi. So let us take up the mantle. Let us help one another. If you hear a child in the neighbor's house crying, it's quite likely because of a packet of milk, and you may be having a whole KCC carton of 12. Na ukipatiana hiyo moja mtoto atanyamaza. People are carrying secret pain and we have the solutions and we don't want to give them. I pray from today that we will so fight poverty by social action that we will say like in the Acts of the Apostles, there were no needy people among them. It is possible. Ni aibu for Sitam Eldoret to have somebody having to walk from here to Kip Korgot because they cannot afford transport. And we are driving past Kip Korgot to Kaptagat. And so on. Let us be practical let us be concerned about what is going on in the Middle East. Who has said a prayer today for Gaza? Who has said a prayer today for Pokot? Who has done anything that can mean social action today? As I bring this to a close, I would like us to pray for two categories of people. And I'll be asking our senior pastor to help us with this. The first category of prayer that I would like to request is for the Lord to soften the hearts of many of us that are so uncaring. We are so much, we have the solutions, we have the answer to me barikiwa, but we are hoarders. We, we store up instead of giving. That the Lord would soften us to be open to others. I tell you because of being on Facebook, on X, and so on, every day I get a request for food. Now, me who is self-employed, and me in the studio on the Chakula, how can I take care of 10 requests that come? Somebody tells me I've not been able to eat for the last four days. The last four days. And there are times, Nina Toa Mpesa Mpaka, you know, I had to close the Fuliza because 
there's no way I can keep quiet or hold back when somebody is hungry. And I'm just saying this, that some of us can do better than me. And you can actually reach out. Yes, things are bad, but we are the answer. We are the answer and it can be done. So for the Lord to soften our hearts. But the second kind of prayer is for those who actually are going through all these stresses. You are here today. You came to church and you have a secret pain. You know you have anguish. You have stuff that you've gone through. You lost a job and it's been bad. You are depressed. Vitus meku stress. You know what? Jesus is still here. And he's able to fix that for you. And he's able to walk with you. He's able to tell you, my son, you are not alone. He's able to reach out to you because he's compassionate. When he sees you, he sees you as sheep without a shepherd. He'll help you. I want us to pray for those two categories of people. Would you please stand on your feet as I ask the senior pastor, to come to Naomba Wepo Ako and then I see Ewebwana Wama Jeshi to Sikie Kamahu 